This is the new Sony FX30. And Sony asked me if I was interested in shooting a video on this brand new cinema line camera. I was intrigued, of course, so I said yes. And the briefing was quite simple. They said, make it look good and put the camera to the test. This got me thinking, what can I possibly shoot that ticks these boxes? Well, I can tell that I ended up traveling all the way to a deserted island in Indonesia for this project. If you haven't seen the video already, you can find the link in the description below. In this video, I mainly want to discuss my experience shooting with the FX30. I'll go over the settings, the menu, how we rigged it, but also my thoughts on this camera and who I think this camera is for. Before diving into the experience I've had with the FX30, let's get the nerdy stuff out of the way first. The FX30 comes in the exact same body as the FX3 does, and it features an in-body stabilized APS-C sensor. It comes with dual native ISO, allowing you to shoot in different lighting conditions, yet maintain the highest dynamic range possible. The FX3 and the FX30 look a lot alike, but there are some key differences. Some got improved and some got left out to make the camera a bit more budget friendly. Let's start with the improvements. The screw holes on the FX30 are now black, compared to silver on the FX3. I like black. All right, now some real improvements. The FX30 has a higher resolution screen, coming in at 2.36 million dots compared to 1.44 million dots on the FX3. The brightness of both is relatively the same, and I can honestly say that when shooting underwater with like weird reflections and all, the screen was perfectly visible to me. The eye autofocus system is also improved on the FX30, and it now has an additional bird eye AF mode, which could be a deal breaker if that is something you're into, you know, filming birds. The raw recording resolution over HDMI is also slightly improved. FX30 now has 4672 by 2628 pixels compared to the 4264 by 2408 pixels the FX3 offers. FX30 also gives you more lens breathing compensation options both in camera and in Sony's Catalyst browse software. And last but not least, FX30 makes it super simple to connect through your desktop and laptop over USB. The camera is recognized as a webcam without any additional software necessary. That's pretty good if you're a streamer, of course. Now, let's see what they left out, because there's a couple. The FX30 has no mechanical shutter, no uncompressed raw photos, it shoots at a maximum of 1 over 4,000 of a shutter speed, no continuous drive modes, and they remove the red light on the front of the camera that would otherwise help you with AF assist and timing of photos, you know, that red annoying light that, you know, you know what I mean. Then they left the white sensor that allows the FX30 to measure white balance, so that it can do. As you can see, they pretty much got rid of all the photo functionalities, which to me is not necessarily a bad thing because I use this thing for film anyways. So simply put, by getting an FX30, you kind of get everything an FX3 does, but with a 1.6 times crop and black screw holes. That's nice. Let's briefly talk about our journey because it was quite something. We started in Amsterdam. We boarded a plane straight to Singapore. In Singapore, we had five hours of layover time. And of course, we spent all of it eating street food. Then we boarded a plane to Jakarta, which only took us an hour and a half. In Jakarta, we spent the night in a hotel to then fly to Padang the next morning, which also took us about an hour and a half. and then we just roamed around the city for the remainder of the day. The next morning we were supposed to leave on a ferry to the Mentawai Islands, but due to bad weather, that boat didn't leave. So we had to stay another day in Padang. Then the next day we finally left to the Mentawai Islands on a ferry, which took us seven hours. Two of those seven hours were on a speedboat, which was quite a bumpy ride. But after five days of traveling, we made it to our final destination. The main reason for me to choose this place over any other location in the world is the waves. This group of islands is known for its consistent swells, blue clear water and empty lineups, which ended up not being so empty anyways, but that's 
beside the point. This whole thing sounded like a perfect place to test out a new camera and put it through its paces. I don't think there is a worse place for a camera to be in. The constant 30 or even like 36 sometimes degree weather, uh, extreme humidity and tropical storms, earthquakes, you name it, are all factors cameras generally don't like to be used in. What makes this camera so great is the size, of course. That's nothing new because the FX3 has been around for a couple years, but it was so small and compact, yet the image it produces is still so nice we were able to bring two FX30 bodies, a 7200 Mark II with a extender, I think it was a 1.4 times extender, a 1635, 2470, and some additional APC glass, the unwater housing, a very heavy tripod, I think the head only weighed uh, like three kilos already, and still it was kind of a light travel, you know, compared to what you would have if you bring like, proper cinema cameras. If I bring my Sony FX6, for example, I would have probably had to check in a case. What perhaps also made a big difference is that we didn't travel to Antarctica, but to a tropical island. So a couple t-shirts and some board shorts were all you, you know, need to survive or be comfy. Let's kick off with the settings we use during the shoot. We shot most of the project in 4K, 25 frames at one over 50th of a shutter, double the frame rate. We worked in S-Log3 Cine EI workflow, meaning you get two set values of EI, which stands for exposure index. You pre... <coughs> wow. <clears throat> Ooh. You pretty much leave it on either 800, which is the first base ISO, or 2500, which is the second base ISO. These values give you the best overall dynamic range the camera has to offer. Going up or down in e a EI, doesn't change the actual image the camera records. It just shows you a different exposure on the monitor. Because of this, you'll expose to what you see on the monitor and therefore the image will be recorded under or overexposed, depending on the EA val EI value you punched in. Now, if this sounds too complicated, there is a guy on YouTube called Alistair Chapman, who does a way better explanation of, uh, of this whole Cine AI thing. So check the link in the description below. Um, I'll leave it there. Next to Cine EI, you also have Cine EI Quick, which I don't really recommend. And next to that, you have Flexible ISO, which basically is how you would shoot with a hybrid camera, maybe your previous Sony, um, with the regular ISO values, you know. So that's probably what you're used to already. All the underwater shots that we shot were all done in 100 frames at a shutter speed of one over 200. Again, double the frame rate. The autofocus here was a bit different. Normally I set it to wide or you know the widest it can go, but for this, I set it to zone. The reason for this is when I'm filming from the surface of the water, the bottom half is underwater, yet the top half is where all the action happens. So obviously that needs to be in focus. So I simply put my little triangle, no, rectangle thing all the way up the top to make sure that the camera puts that in focus. One thing the camera does not have is shutter angle. And I don't think the FX3 has shutter angle either. But um, this means that every time I change my frame rate from say 50 to 100, I also need to change my shutter speed because you always want to stay at at least double the frame rate. When I'm in the water filming, I don't want to press too many buttons because I am kind of already trying to stay alive. So I use the MR modes to quickly access different shooting modes, which really made shooting from the water a lot easier and faster. I have my regular shooting mode with 25 frames on MR1, then my SNQ 50P on MR2, and then my underwater settings with 100 frames per second on MR3. I also swapped my aperture control ring from the front ring to the back ring because I could not use the front ring in the underwater housing. The last thing that I changed was the ISO button, now controlling the base ISO values, um, which is very handy because when I'm diving underwater, sometimes it's more dark. So I press the button and I have more light to work with. This configuration made it super simple and extremely fast to operate this camera. A quick note on shooting in 100 or 120 frames per second, this mode crops in a fair bit. So in the end, you're left with quite a lot of noise. This, of course, is nothing crazy because you punch into what is already a very small sensor, but I've noticed during the grading process that getting rid of this image noise was quite easy by using the built-in noise reduction tool from DaVinci Resolve. The entire shoot from on land and in the water was all shot on the internal batteries. 
these things last a lifetime. My surf swim film sessions could take up to three hours and I could do it all on one charge of a battery. The way I set this up was go into the menu and then tick the power save start time, I think it's called. Um, and put it to one minute. I only had to press one random button to flip the camera back on. The boot time is very quickly, I think it was like three, four seconds. So then it's ready to shoot. So what you want. Now, let's talk about the camera configurations. As mentioned before, we brought two FX30s, one for me and one for Wouter. Mine was mainly set up as basic as it gets, meaning the body, lens, top handle, uh, Sony microphone, and then the plate that works with my underwater housing as I was shooting handheld or from the water only. Wouter's was a bit more advanced. He used the top handle, an Atomos Shinobi, I think, uh, as his monitor, and then a shotgun mic, and then the plate that worked on his Miller tripod. As he shot from land quite often, he used his Miller tripod to get smooth shots. To shoot from land, we used the 70 to 200 Mark II with the 1.4 times extender to get these very long tele shots. This configuration gave us a whopping 220, I think, no, 210 by 600 millimeter full frame equivalent, which is plenty for anything that we wanted to do. Let's talk about the thoughts I have on this camera. I'm shooting with the FX6 a lot lately. And I also use the FX3 as a gimbal cam or a B cam on set. What I like most about this setup is that they both look nearly identical. But the most important thing is that the field of view doesn't change because they're both full frame cameras. That said, 4,700 euros for a gimbal camera or B camera is a lot of money. This trip certainly made it more than clear that the FX30 is an amazing gimbal or B cam. All the important functionalities are still there, such as autofocus, sensor stabilization, uh, and of course the image quality is, you know, all baked into the camera. Does that mean that I'm not going to shoot with the FX3 no more? Not really. Listen up. Personally, I think the FX3 is a perfect standalone camera on shoots that don't allow you to bring a bigger cinema camera like the FX6. Think of tour skiing in the mountains or a project like this one, um, you know, going far away to Indonesia. I love the full frame look and how wide it can go. And that is definitely something I missed while shooting on the FX30. Also, when being on the move, having the extra photography options is great because that kind of makes it so you can leave your stills camera at home. Now, when I'm shooting in a more controlled environment, I think the FX30 is great. I'd love to try it out as a B cam or as a camera to mount in weird spots, you know, like cars or corners. Um, you know, in the end, these are all my personal thoughts. In general, I think this camera is amazing for anyone that wants to start out in a cine kind of camera because the options that this camera provides are also found in the much higher end models like the FX6 or the FX9 or even the Venice or even Airy, you know, other cameras. It offers you an amazing value for money and really is a great camera when looking at the image. The fact that you can get two FX30s for the price of one FX3 kind of says it all. Now, there are a lot of great cameras out on the market in this price range. Think of Blackmagic, uh, Panasonic, Canon, and other Sony cameras. And personally, I think you cannot go wrong with either of them. They all produce an outstanding image quality. So, you know, that makes it even harder to make the choice. But the points that I would focus on when trying to figure out which camera system to choose are what do you want to shoot? Is it travel films, uh, weddings, short films, documentaries, corporate stuff, you name it? Um, do you need autofocus? Is battery life a big issue? Um, but also, and this is something that is often overlooked, but does the camera fit into your and your client's workflow? For example, I'm working on a big TV shoot right now and Blackmagic RAW was just no option. And that is mainly because that whole post-production workflow my client has is based around Sony cameras. So when, you know, a camera guy like me comes in and says like, hey, I want to shoot on Blackmagic RAW, they're like, hell no. All these factors should be taken into account before pressing that buy button. It's not in my power to tell you which camera to buy, but you have to do your own research. Rewatch this video and maybe, you know, if you like what you're hearing, get the FX30. If not, then keep on doing your research until you find a camera that suits your work or suits your style or shoots the goals that you have. Um, so that's that. This has been such an amazing opportunity for me. Truly, I cannot believe that I was asked to, you know, do this whole thing and 
you know, given the freedom to make this project happen. But of course, I could not do it alone. So quick thank you is in place, I guess. Um, so a huge thank you to Sony for helping me out doing this, but also Walter, Aaron, Ben, Chinta, Aileen, Ray, the whole Driftwood crew, all the captains, um, you know, on the Mentas that, that sailed us around all the time. Um, huge thank you to you all. Um, thanks so much for watching, guys. And uh, so stoked. Thank you.